and welcome back to Old School. Today we're going to be in the emotional and spiritual quadrants, and our guest teacher is Rhonda Stoppy. Her, uh, she is the author of Real Life Romance, among other books. Um, this one had a little more resonance with me, um, but she has seven or eight very wonderful books that you can find on her website. Uh, Rhonda is the author and speaker dedicated to helping women live life with no regrets, as is indicated by her website being noregretswoman.com. <laughs> with over 30 years experience as a mom, a mentor, and a pastor's wife, Rhonda's wisdom and experience will help you discover significance in God and his specific purpose for your life. She has, as I said, written many books. She also has a podcast <laughs> called Old Ladies Know Stuff, and I just love that. I It plays off very well off of old school with uh, Michelle Vrabel because we're old and we know stuff, and, and we're going to school you. And so I just would love it if you would welcome today to class Rhonda, and uh, let's hear what great wisdom she has about having no regrets. Hi, Michelle. I am so excited to be on your show today. I'm Rhonda Stoppy, No Regrets Woman, because I help women build no regrets lives and I help them break free from regrets that hold them back. I'm also the host of the newly awarded uh, podcast. What is it called? <laughs> Old Ladies Know Stuff. I, I was, love that name. Love it. It goes along with the title of yours, really. <laughs> I'm like, oh, we're kindred spirits and we're close to the same age. I graduated high school in 1979. I don't know what year do you graduate? 78? 70- 80. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, So my story, oh my word, it has just been such an interesting watching how God has just nudged here, dragged me there, unfolded this and opened the door to that. So uh, let's just start with some of the things. I married my, my high school sweetheart. He actually was, came home from college when I met him and he's uh, six and a half years older than I am. And we did not get married right away. He ran from me for a long time. In fact, on my YouTube channel, you can see Steve and I trying to tell our love story, our real life romance story, because we can't remember it. It's 42 years ago is when we got married and we dated for a long time before that. But he has just been the love of my life. But there was a time after we got married that I was not the wife I meant to be. I was not fun. I was not joyful. I was irritated. I had so much work to do. I was working in corporate America. We lived in the San Francisco Bay Area and we both worked full time and I would come home from work and there'd be stuff everywhere. And I'd spend my weekends cleaning where before we got married, I lived in an apartment by myself. I cleaned it, stayed clean. And, you know, weekends were for dating and going to do fun things. And all of a sudden I'm grocery shopping and cooking and cleaning. And he was in construction at the time. So it was just constant laundry, which (laughs) now 42 years later, I'd be like, wear those jeans again. Back in that day, I washed a pair of jeans every day. They were (laughs) because I was trying to be a good wife. But as I was trying to do all the things, I found myself becoming resentful. And I, you know, those little digging comments or those little thoughts that just kind of steal your joy. And I come from a long line of divorce. Uh, the, the marriages in my family just unraveled. And uh, it's the thing I didn't want. And yet I found myself becoming just like the women that I had observed in my upbringing And I was doing the same thing to my husband and I knew I needed help. So that is the first like aha moment when we realize I'm not the one I wanted to be. Now I have a book out called if my husband would change, I'd be happy and other myths wives believe because we all want to believe that if he would just change, I would be happy. Or just do what you tell him. (laughs) Right, right, right. It's like, don't you understand? And one of the stories that I tell is I came home from work one day and there were peanut butter crumbs all over the counter in the kitchen. Him and his brother, they were in construction. It was a rainy day. So they didn't work that day. They were at home playing Atari. (laughs) And I came home on my lunch hour and there was crumbs everywhere. And I gasped and I started crying. And Steve's like, what is wrong with the crazy lady? And I, but, but for me, those crumbs meant you don't care what I do all day. I try to keep this house neat and you just mess it up and you don't care. In his mind, he used the counter to make his peanut butter toast instead of a plate. So I wouldn't have a dish to wash. And so that was just one of those things, right? It's just the issue's not the issue. So I knew I needed help. So we were in youth ministry at the time. So I looked around at the marriages 
that I wanted to emulate. The ones that had been married for a long time that still laughed at each other's jokes, held hands when they were walking and their kids wanted to bring their friends home to their house. And I'm like, I need to know what they know. And so I went to these older women and said, hey, I want to learn what you know. I have no idea. I was not raised in a home and my grandparents all divorced or had terrible marriages. I don't know what it's supposed to look like. And these women, I said, I, I want you to help me. And so a lot of times as I'm older, I have found that when women think they're going to find a mentor, they want to find somebody they can just dump on and just say, my life is so hard. And this is why, and this is how bad my husband is. And this is my financial plight. And this is my, you know, all the things. And now I feel better because I dumped on you and I'm going to go back and live my life. And I'll see you next week and tell you how hard my life is again. And that drains the mentor. And it also does no one any good. So for those that are listening that are our, my age or, you know, looking to be a mentor, there is a way to mentor someone that helps them grow and doesn't drain you or cause you to feel all the anxiety of their life every time they call. And I'm a pastor's wife. My husband's been a senior pastor for 25 years. We were in youth ministry for 18 years. And that you you can be sucked dry. I know a lot of pastor's wives that are just exhausted. And the reality is if someone calls me and says, hey, I need help with my marriage. I want some help with my kids. Um, I will meet with them. But I will say, okay, we're going to read this book together and you read a chapter and I'll read the chapter. And then next week we're going to come together and we'll talk about that chapter. And sometimes I do it virtually. Sometimes I do it in person. Uh, let's talk about that chapter. Well, if I get to the meeting with them and they have not read their chapter, I don't meet with them. I'm like, you know what? I don't blame you. Go if they're back. not going to be invested, why should you? It's exactly. And they'll say, I don't have time to read the books. Like, well, I don't really have time to meet with you. I'm making time for you. And the only way this time is going to be profitable is if you've done the homework so that we have something to discuss. So if you are a mentor or an older woman who wants to pour into those that are right behind you, that Titus two woman calling that we have, that's a, that's a number one tip that I want to give you is don't just let that time be them venting and you telling them I'm so sad and so sorry for you. And let me pray for you. Or jumping on the bandwagon and telling them that you agree how hard their life is because that's they love that, but it doesn't do anybody any good. So for me, when I reached out to these ladies, I kind of wanted them to tell me all the things I wanted to hear. And in reality, they were like, come to our Bible study. And I'm like, uh, I, I don't need a Bible study. I, I went to Christian schools. I know the Bible. I, I have a newborn. I don't need the Bible study but I need to know how to be a better wife. And they're like, just my friend, Gail. Um, and Gail's like 17 years older than I am, which my mom was 17 when I was born. So Gail's the same age as my mom, which I told her, you're my mom's age. And she's like offended, but then she's like, oh, I am. Okay, <laughs> we'll be friends. <laughs> but I went to this Bible study and it was a, a precept Bible study, which is five hours of homework a week. And I'm like, I don't have time to do that. I am a mom, I've got a kid. And my friend Gail said, just try to work through the book of Philippians is what we were going through. And she said, if it doesn't transform you, if it doesn't help you, then I'll leave you alone. And she said, I'll do whatever I can to help you get through it, but just try. So I'm like, all right, I'll try. And honestly, my spiritual motivation, free babysitting and three hours with grownups. And I had quit corporate America to be a stay-at-home mom. So I was super lonely. And it's like, I wanted to get out of my sweatpants and get dressed all cute and hang out with ladies. And that was my motivation. And you weren't allowed to talk if you didn't do your homework. So truly the reason I did my homework was so I could talk. <laughs> what a process for, for women in particular. I'm not going to say I don't know a bunch of men who are chatty, but to yeah. come to Bible study and not be able to like, you know. <laughs> yeah, because I'd be wasting their time. If I hadn't done the homework, sure. then I'm saying, oh, what that was to me. And they're like, but what does it mean in the context of where we find it? So I said, okay. And what I found, and I'm getting teared up. Oh. These women were real. They were genuine. They shared their highs and their lows, their regrets, their failures, their successes, the joy, the way that God took what was evil and used it for good. And that was gold. And when women are like, I don't have time, or they want to meet in a Bible study with a bunch of 20 somethings, because that's how old they are. I'm like, go to the blue haired Nana's Bible study because they're the ones. The purple hat ladies. Yes. <laughs> they're going to give you the discernment because they've lived it and they've lived long enough to see how God took that thing and made good from it. 
And so that was my my beginning of my love for scripture. In fact, I love the book of Philippians so much. I have the whole book memorized, except for the chapter, chapter three. I, for some reason, I cannot, I got COVID in the middle of memorizing chapter three and my brain just, it's all pieces all over the place. But I have one, two, and four memorized and three, I'm, I'm on my way. And I go over that every morning before I get out of bed. Now, I know some young women are like, I can't, I get out of bed to a two-year-old opening my eyes for me. I don't have time to do that. I get that. There are seasons and I couldn't do it. When my kids were little, I kept my Bible open on my table and I did the homework here while nursing a baby. I did the homework whenever I had a few minutes here or there. I just told the Lord, I don't have time but I want to know all that you want me to know. And I want to be the woman. And the Bible says it's the word of God that's quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. You will never know yourself more clearly than through the lens of scripture sure. because it divides the thoughts and intents of your own heart. It gives you discernment over your own self-righteousness, your own, uh, you know, I wish my husband would be better and then I'd be happier. And it's like, it's all his fault and I'm self-righteous and he's the one or, or whatever it is. I'm a people pleaser. I'm a middle child people pleaser. I was just captivated by the people pleasing tendencies, knowing who I am and my worth by how God reveals his love for me, sets me free from running after affirmation from every person out there that I want to please because I want them to like me. And if you're a people pleaser, you know what I'm saying. And I have a book, Moms Raising Sons to Be Men. And one of the ver chapters in there says people pleasing isn't pleasing because it's not, it's exhausting. And if we are people pleasers, we raise our kids for what people think of us and we ruin our kids because we raise them because we want people to think I'm a good mom. And an older mentor said to me, never raise your kids for what people think of you. You will destroy them. That is not your goal is for people to think you're a good mom. That is absolutely people pleasing and it will destroy your children and it will send them into rebellion. I needed to hear that from someone that was older that was watching me raise my kids for what people thought of me. So old ladies know stuff. Yeah, they do. <laughs> I was, my daughter went to a small Christian school and I was old when I had her. I was 38. So I was technically old enough to be the mom's mom, <laughs> but I, be, I tend to have the ability to be friends with like the ages. And, um, so I, I, to this day, hang out with, uh, lady, young ladies that are, you know, 10, 15 years younger than me because they like me and we, we get along and we have a similar, you know, ideas in regard to what to listening to the Lord and pressing in as parents and what have you. But it is hard not to want to go in front of our kids and want to, you know, smooth that path because we don't want them to have to walk through what we did. But what is so wrong with who we are and how our character was built to get here? So, it, but it, I get it. I, I don't know that I'm 100% a people pleaser in the sense of worrying about them liking or, or approving of my life choices because I have a lot of people who don't and I'm just like okay <laughs> but within my family I am a middle child and those opinions and those things do bear weight and it should be just like you're saying it should be the same that there I should be performing for an audience of one mm -hmm. um and um and he he knows what is awesome about me and what needs work. And I should, you know, let that be the final say. <laughs> and he adores us. Yeah. Just who we are. And when we really spend time meditating on his adoration for us, as he reveals himself through the pages of scripture, I was speaking at an event in Southern California a week ago. And I'm like, my husband, when I travel, when I'm speaking, I, we miss each other. We live in the middle of nowhere. We live in the country, like 45 minutes from the nearest town. And he works from home sometimes and I'm gone and he'll text and we'll banter back and forth. And we flirt with each other. And we talk about this and we talk about that. And when he, when, then I'll call him if I've been gone for a long time. And then he's like, what? And I'm like, hi, I just wanted to hear your voice. He's like, okay. And he doesn't like talking on the phone. And I'm like, dude, <laughs> and you were just so cute and charming through text. Where'd you go? <laughs> but the idea is this, if I would never, if I would be so busy out there doing important things that I don't have time to check my text from my, my husband, I would be missing his adoration for me. I'm missing his connection with me, his words of encouragement and uplifting and advice and cheering me on. That's what happens when we ignore scripture. 
God's like, open the book, like Mary and Martha. Well, we all know her story. Jesus is like, Mary chose the better thing. She's sitting here at my feet and she's listening and she is falling more in love with me as I speak truth over her. So uh, that's that to me was gold that I learned from these older women was that um, I was trying hard to be a good Christian, to do all the things that I thought God wanted me to do. And you know, Mark chapter 12, 30, the, the religious leaders asked Jesus, what's protos? What's the priority of life? And he's like, fall in love with God, love him with your whole being, with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then the second is love your neighbor as yourself. Well, I wanted to love God with all I do. Watch God. I love you so much. Look what I'm doing. He's like, slow down, Skippy. I don't need you to do anything. I need you to fall in love with who I am as I've revealed myself through scripture. I am El Roy, the God who sees. I am Jehovah Nisi, your banner. I am the one that is going to set your path and guide your steps and cause all things to work together for good. Fall in love with who I really am, not who you perceive me to be. Then I can entrust you with what I want to do in and through your life. Yeah, that our, we can sometimes put our cart before the horse on our purpose, thinking that we have to produce something and then go lay it at his feet and say, how's that? versus, um, you know, pressing into him. I, as I've gotten older, I, I, I have a prayer time in the morning in my living room and it's out loud and my daughter's just decided I'm nuts anyway. So I'm in there and we've dispensed with subtly. Um, I, 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 people find it hard to believe. They don't think I'm telling the truth, but it, this is literally how the Lord and I roll. I literally, I mean, who knows my day better than him. So I'm going to sit and talk to him frankly, as if I'm talking to him about a daytime or which dates me to all get out. But anyway, and um, we've dispensed with subtly. He's like very quick to show me where he is going to reveal something to me. And then there are other situations like, like if I, if he has a man for me, if he told me I was going to meet him at Starbucks, I'd be going to all the Starbucks in a 10 mile radius, seeing if I could work it out. You know? Yeah. He's like, I ain't doing that. <laughs> That's not how I work. In there. Yeah. And <laughs> so he knows better. So my comment to him, my conversation with him is fly open the doors I'm supposed to use and put flaming seraphim in front of the ones I'm supposed to stay away from. Yes. And I'm a, I, I, a step is enough, but He's been my provider my whole life, and especially since my divorce. So even if he doesn't give me that next step, I, I know that wh where I'm headed is the purpose he's got for me, and I'm in that lane pressing into him, and uh, he'll give me what he'll give me, and I just know it'll be there. So, Yeah, and you know, one of the stories that I comes to mind for me when, um, and it's actually in a book called, I think it's called Fierce Calling, but I can't remember if that's actually, <laughs> I can't remember his name, but I wrote a chapter for it. And I just read through the chapter the other day and just to kind of remind me of what it says. But there was a season in my life when all of my kids, we have four children. Our oldest son um, is a fighter pilot in the Air Force. Actually, he just retired as a lieutenant colonel. And my two other children were down in Southern California for college. And I had a, a daughter still at home. And I was driving and saying, Lord, what do you want me to do? What What's the next step? I don't know what you want me to do. I'm going to be an empty nester and I don't know what you want me to do. Now, previously, before that, when I had, we had had planted a church in Austin, Texas. And when we moved back to California, I'm born and raised California to the church that my husband has now pastored at for almost 25 years. I um, went to a pastor's wife's conference and the, one of the speakers, what do you call it? Counselors did a workshop. And I went to that and he was a pastor who now worked as a counselor instead and he gave a talk and he said, my son, when he was eight years old, I answered the phone one day and he screamed at the phone, leave my daddy alone. And he said, I was a pastor and I was always available to my people. I loved my ministry. I loved what I did, but I put my ministry before my family. And my son was crying out, you're choosing them over us. And he said, and I didn't listen to my son. And he said, time went on for quite a while before he realized his son started making bad friend choices started getting into trouble. At that point, this man, his name's Greg, quit. He resigned as a pastor and started working as a counselor and tried to re, you know, uh, rekindle relationship with his son, but it was too late. His son had joined the Mexican mafia. 
um, and wanted nothing to do with Christ, wanted nothing to do with his father. He was just in full on rebellion. So Greg was sharing this story and he said, don't, you know, listen to what I, what I learned is don't do that. Don't put your ministry. Your kids are your ministry, your marriage and your children are your priority ministry. And I was so convicted that Kayla, my youngest, that I was going to lose Kayla if I kept doing the things I was doing. I was speaking at women's events. I was gone all the time. It was fun. I loved it. Well, you, before that, our, our younger, I mean, our older kids, we had raised in youth ministry. They went to youth camp with us. They went to all the youth events. They loved all the things youth ministry. But in women's events, I was leaving her with a friend or with Steve or wherever. And I was like, I'm going to lose Kayla. And so I remember driving home and I was in tears because I loved what I was doing. And I said, okay, Lord, I'm going to quit. And I don't know what that's going to look like, but I'm going to quit because I don't want to lose Kayla over this. I would rather do nothing than lose one of my kids. And I went home and I made a commitment and I, you know, I still spoke, taught women's Bible study at church, taught a women's tea once in a while, but I was done. And I waited on the Lord and my kids grew up and they all followed Christ. And I am by the grace of God, so blessed that my kids are now serving the Lord. They're married. They have wonderful spouses. But on the day that I knew I was going to be an empty nester and I was crying, I was like, Lord, I have wasted all of these years not doing what I wanted to do. I don't have a platform. I don't have, I don't know what to do from here. And the Lord just really impressed on my heart to write. And I'm like, I'm not a writer. I don't want to write anything. <laughs> I'm not a writer Me either. <laughs> I, I'm a speaker. I'm an evangelist. I, you know, I'm a mentor. I'm not a writer. And uh, so I got a book about how to become a published author. And it's like, go to writers conferences, meet with editors, create book proposals, get five minutes with an editor, get your foot in the door, sell yourself. And I closed the book and I told the Lord, I'm not doing that. That's not who I am. I don't want to do that. That's not what I'm about. I'm not going to do that. So Lord, if you want me to write a book, you're going to have to drag me through an open door. Here's my arm, drag me. I'm not knocking on a door. I'm not kicking down a door. I am not doing it. But if you want it happen, you make it happen. So the next year I went to um, pastor's wife's conference and one of the speakers, she and I had lunch together. I was the coordinator for that event. So we were having lunch together. And, and as we were telling our stories and laughing and interacting, she said, Rhonda, why are you not a published author? And I said, oh, I'm, I'm not a writer. I'm not a, I'm not a, I don't do that. And I said, why would you ask that? She goes, well, your stories need to connect people with truth. And I said, no, I'm not a writer. And she reached over and she grabbed my arm. I said, I'm a speaker. I'm a teacher. I'm evangelist. She grabbed my arm and she said, Rhonda, writing is just speaking on paper. She said, my books go to prisons. They go places I'll never go. And they speak truth to women who read them. And as she grabbed my arm, I just started to cry. And I she said, was I don't grabbing your arm. <laughs> yeah. I said, I, yeah, right. I said, I don't know how. And she said, do you have anything you've written? And I had written a devotional for the pastor's wives in 2008. And she said, let me read it. And so she came back and she said, I'm going to help you write a book proposal. And so we wrote five book proposals. She called me once a week for a year. And she's now a writing coach. Her name's Cindy McMiniman. If you need a writing coach, she's awesome. And at the time she wasn't a writing coach. She was a speaker and an author and she was a pastor's wife, but she was like, I want to help you. So we wrote five book proposals. She sent them to her editor at Harvest House Publishers and they looked at them and came back and said, no, thank you. We don't need any of those books. And I'm like, that's great. I, I'm done. I'm so happy you tried, but I'm good. But the editor and the president of Harvest House asked to meet with me. And so I met them at a conference down in uh, Southern California that my husband was going to. So I'm like, I'll meet you there. And uh, they just said, just talk to us about your speaking topics. What is the most standing room only? What is the thing that people love the most? And I go, well, standing room only is really moms raising sons to be men. The women are weeping by the time I'm done talking because everybody wants their son to, you know, grow up uh, with a purpose and a passion. And we don't know how to help them get there. And Bob, the president of Harvest House said, I want you to write that book. And I'm like, mm, I'm not the boy mom. I have two sons. One of them didn't even come to our family till he was 15 years old. I have two daughters. I'm not the boy mom. And he said, write that book. I'm like, okay. So I met, I had the sweetest editor. I'm like, I do not know how to write. I dangle participles, run on sentences. And he's like, that's okay. I'm going to teach you. And for a year, once a month, I wrote a chapter. He sent it back, wrote all over it, crossed things out. Why is this here? This doesn't even make sense. And 
at the end of the year, we had Moms Raising Sons to be men. And it published in 2013. It's my first book ever published. It was a bestseller. In fact, it was such a bestseller that um, they came back in 2023 and said, we need to do a, a 10 year anniversary edition of the book because it's a, a decade's gone by and it's a new world, obviously. And so it just came out and it was a bestseller when it came out. Uh, Christian Audio picked it up. It became their number one bestseller on Christian audio. Um, I've written a number of books for Harvest House Publishers since then. I have seven books out, I think, total. And the point of the whole story is I didn't want to write a book. And I knew if the Lord wanted to make it happen, he's the one that was going to make it happen. So a lot of times when God whispers something to your heart, it's a decade later before he opens the doors and he's got to prepare you. He's got to get you to a place where you're ready to be his humble servant. And so that he can use you in a way that brings glory to him and not glory to yourself. So the timing of, of it, and that's why you want to make friends with old ladies. Cause we know stuff and we have stories of how God said, I got something for you, but not yet. Hold on. And I, in my mom's raising sons book, I say, your children are not a distraction to your ministry. They are your ministry. So that's, you know, your marriage and your, if you're not married, um, but your children priority one, don't make them feel just like I, I got things to do out, out there and you're not important. They are the number one thing that God's called us to do. And when we do that with him doing it through us, just like we would, if we were going to be missionaries somewhere, how did you prepare yourself for the mission field? You didn't just go find cute clothes that match the culture, learn the <laughs> language, right? You studied. Am I going to like African food? Exactly. <laughs> but motherhood, we need to we need to equip ourselves, and that's why I write the books that I write because Titus two calls older women to teach the younger how to love their husbands and love their children, and that's that's my sweet spot. Is this is what God has called me to do, and this is where I want to put these books into women's hands. My resources, my website, noregretswoman.com, my podcast, old ladies know stuff. Um, as many things as I can put out there, I I want to be that Titus two woman for the season that God's called me to do it. And every time I finish a book, I'm like, can I be done now? And then the Lord like opens a door and something else. And I'm like, I'll say yes if the door opens, but I'm not pushing any doors open. <laughs> I'm not knocking. You can leave I'm the knob off. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't feel that way either. And it was 10 years ago when he first originally kind of tapped me to do it. And I was in the middle of a study in Isaiah and we had dipped over into Esther. And so originally a lot of how the book was laid out was based on like Esther's such a time as this kind of a situation for me, that it was time for everything that I had been through to work together for good. And he wasn't surprised by me dragging my feet and hemming and hawing and claiming I was Moses. I wasn't the right one. Um, <laughs> but then I went through my divorce and it was like, that was the capstone. That was the final capstone. That was where it's going to, at least the initial one is going to stop. And I still was naive enough to think when I got my writing coaches, Bob and Kim, that I was still only going to write one book. And they're like, well, I, we got to tell you, publishers don't really like one hit wonders. They, they want to know that you got something else in the tank, at least one. Yeah. So they have already pried that one apart. And so I do have to, I don't know what's going to happen with it, but I do know this, that the Lord called me to do this. And if in, even just in my mind, if everything I went through doesn't get worked out together for some good, I'm, I don't know what to do with that. That would be the bigger disobedience. And I had a, um, went to a conference recently. Do you know Jen Wilkin? I know the name, but I don't know her. She's a Christian author as well. And she spoke at this conference uh, with Lisa Turker. So it was a Lifeway thing. Mm -hmm. And um, she spoke on Rahab. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, she, you, as you know, most Rahab isn't the big topic of conversation most of the time. At church. <laughs> but anyway, she, to, to shorten it, she talked about how no, no daughter in that time frame wanted to grow up to be a prostitute. They weren't walking around saying, Ooh, I get to do this. But the, the culture, the economy, everything at that time, because the Israelites were disobedient and took 40 more years before they came for the deliverance of Jericho, her deliverance was delayed by their disobedience. And I felt like this young lady had reached out and slapped me in the face. Um, 
I don't know if I, if this is going to impact more than just one person or more than just me, but I do know this. I felt like my dragging my feet and my disobedience was going to delay the deliverance of someone from the same, you know, weight, the same, you know, as I healed my, it felt like a tumor was being removed from my body without anesthesia. And so it, it just was so, um, a, a good slap in the faith as a girlfriend of mine. And I say, <laughs> that's good. Well, and the, the word says that we comfort others with the comfort that we ourselves have been comforted. So when you walk through something that people are like, I don't know if I could survive it. And you have hope on the other end and you, you know, God shows up because he's a father to the fatherless and he watches those and those that are left destitute because of some spouse that is gone for all of those reasons, you have hope that you can share from your story. And that's, that's the good that comes out of it. That's the, all things work together for good. That is the good is oh, his, yeah. your, uh, the weight of your story helps someone else believe there's hope for them too. And the, and the, the difference for me too has always been because you know this as you're writing queries and proposals and they want you to take 70,000 words of your whole life or whatever the whole story and make three sentences and make it so interesting that nobody wants to walk away from you <laughs> and yeah, I'm like the hook, the hook. I don't even know if the 70,000 words can make me that interesting <laughs> I know, <laughs> <laughs> but nonetheless, I think I could do a stand-up routine better. <laughs> I studied, but, I studied comedy in college. <laughs> but I, when I talk to my coach, especially Kim, because she works more with the words with me, I, it's, um, she, she is surprised in my, right in the midst of my story. I talk about how even at two, one of the worst beatings I got was at two because I had lost a shoe and yeah. I remember, I don't know, I didn't know the word evil. I didn't know who God was, but I remember thinking as my father left the room and closed the door that that was him. I didn't do anything that he's just bad. Mm -hmm. And wow. that has sustained me. And the only reason I feel that suicide was never the thought process or not being able to live and survive and thrive because I feel that the comforter that the Lord promises when we accept him and have a relationship with him for the little ones is there all along. Mm -hmm. And he had my mind. He was able to help me even at two reconcile what was going on enough to not let it crush me, not let and it for, take me. And for many listeners right now, that's not their story. For many yeah. listeners right now, Absolutely. the issues made them believe they were not lovable. They were worthless. They were to be discarded. Uh, all those things that the enemy who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But that's where, when when they come to wholehearted devotion to Jesus Christ, like not just believing who he is, but saying, I'm in, all in, 100%. I don't just believe that Jesus is the son of God. I give my life to Jesus, the son of God. The, the rich young ruler, when Jesus said, do you, oh, you believe? And he said, oh, you know, I believe all these things. And Jesus said, sell everything and follow me. Well, why? Because it wasn't a matter of just a mental assent that Jesus was the rabbi. He said, your idol is your stuff. You're finding your worth in your stuff, your value in your stuff. So sell it and make me your whole heart, your whole life. And I will show you, I will do exceedingly abundantly above all you could ask or imagine. And, and I feel like a lot of people that might be listening are like, why is my Christian walk just not what it was when I first came to Jesus? Why? And so often it's because we've just picked up so many things along the way that have weighed us down. And I love the apostle Paul is like, shake off all of those things that so easily beset you. I guess that's the book of Hebrews and run the race that is set before you uh, in Philippians. I pressed toward the mark of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Whoa. I want to run that race. I want mm -hmm. my zeal for Christ to be such a burning fire in my bosom that my grandkids can't ignore it. My 15 grandkids might say Nana's a little bit crazy, 
But that crazy lady loves Jesus. She loves the Lord. (laughs) She loved Jesus. I don't want them to say I'm a religious lady. I don't want them to say she was a good lady that did good things for the church. Or she goes to church every week. People walk away from that every day of the week. But to say my grandma was in love with Jesus and it changed her, that is hard to ignore. And they can if they choose to walk away, but it's not going to be because of me. It would be in spite of me, in spite of my joy, in spite of my zeal for Christ. So, you know, as an old woman who knows stuff, I've lived the Christian life both ways. I've lived it doing what's expected and doing it because I know it's the right thing to do. And I prayed and asked Jesus to be my savior. So I'm going to obey him all my life, which is all good things to say. But once in a while, I'd meet somebody who was just straight up in love with Jesus. And I'd be like, I don't know what that looks like. I would say I love Jesus. But I knew I wasn't in love with Jesus. And I remember one day being broken and just saying, Lord, I know I don't love you the way you've asked me to love you. But the Bible says you have not because you ask not. So I'm asking you, make me love you. Make make me love you more than all the things this world has to offer. I was let me I wanted to love God for what he could do for me, for how he could bless me. I was raised with some distorted teachings on, you know, if you love Jesus, everything's going to be healthy, wealthy, and prosperous. Uh, it don't work that way. I want to believe, I want to love Jesus, not for what I think I can get out of him. I want to just love him. I just want to be a woman in love with Jesus and a woman who knows who I would be without Jesus. And I want to walk in humble gratitude and daily, Lord, help me to search my heart daily. Let me seek your face. And and I don't do it perfectly. There's days I just get caught up or I'm lazy or I just pursue whatever, but Lord, wake me up. I want to tell people about Jesus. Who are they? Send me to the coffee shops, send me where they are, bring them across my path and then hit me over the head. So I see their face and I know how desperate they are to know the meaning of life. And let me share them my story of how you brought me salvation so that I can share that hope with someone else. Always ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within you. Always ready. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think so much about lifestyle and how, like, I, I, I say that my podcast isn't religious, but it's faith-based because I am. And that um, just like Bob Goff, he and I talk, we have a similar style. He, if you look at his books, you notice he's, it's not laced with scripture because he says he's speaking to Joe the mechanic. Right. And it's a lifestyle evangelism, if you will, to another churchy term, but whatever, um, that is just showing that his deep love and relationship with the Lord is what guides him and propels him along, what the choices that he makes, his foundation, love does, you know, and, and that's exactly how I feel about it. I I do like, I mean, every now and then I like to tell people that I really love the King James Bible, but I'm not one of those people that has to, that has to be the thing or the carpet at the church or the type of music or the this or the that, the things that everybody likes to use as their little pickiness to not go to a church or something when ultimately what I want them to really understand is that my King Jesus and his provision for me and his love for me is like you said, beyond what we could ask or imagine. And that's what you want. That's what you want them to grab a hold of. That's what you want them to get out of our story. And I desperately, that is, I I know honor and glory to me. Let me kneel so I can get out of the way of his arm moving. And, and that makes podcasts, books, whatever, wherever my words are going to come out, it makes it perfect and beautiful. Yeah, that's right. So a couple of things I would love to offer your um, listeners. If you text The words, no regrets, all caps, all one word, no regrets to the number 55444. You can get a free video of me teaching your marriage can survive toddlers and teens. So that's, that's out there. Can you email me that as well? So I can make sure it's in the show notes. That'd be awesome. I will. will. And on my, uh, if you go to my um, YouTube channel, Rhonda Stoppy, No Regrets Woman, you can, the first clip that comes up. If you're not a subscriber, it'll be the first one you see. It's a, it's a slideshow of a song that my son, Brandon wrote for me for mother's day. And my son, Brandon is a worship pastor. And I tell the story in mom's raising sons. And actually Brandon and I were just on focus on the family together. Um, He's a worship pastor. He has four kids of his own. And it was just so great to hear him share his insights. Uh, He struggled with epilepsy as a child and how God used that to raise him up to be a worship pastor now. 
but he wrote this song and focus on the family played a portion of it on the interview. And then they asked me, make a slideshow with just your family, just your grandkids and your kids only, you know, not anybody else. Cause I had another one that I had created with lots of different moms that are in my life, but this one is just my family and it's the best song. It's the best song. It'll make you cry. And it's, it's called, it's all in a mother's love. Oh, and it, yeah. And it's just the best slide. It'll make you cry. Uh, and you can download it. I think it's 99 cents on Spotify or Apple music, wherever you get your songs, but, uh, but you can watch that video and it'll give you glimpses of all of my family and my husband and my grandkids. And I'm captivated by my family. They are just the love of my life. I just adore every single one of them. And let's see what else. Oh, and then Old Ladies Know Stuff is my podcast. And you can subscribe to Old Ladies Know Stuff. And you can watch some of uh, the videos of it on my YouTube channel. Or you can listen to it on wherever you get your podcasts. And I think the number one um, podcast for 23 was What to Do When You Don't Know What to Do. So that one, you can find that if you scroll through there. Perfect. Well, absolutely fabulous. And I, and I, lo I love the name so much. I wouldn't even care if you talked about, you know, red recipes the whole time. I just love that name. <laughs> and 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 I and I tell people it's old school with Michelle Vrabel because I'm old and I'm gonna school you. <laughs> yes. Love it. Love it. Yeah, okay, and so I, I end this. every podcast with this question. If you listen to my I didn't get to with Bob, but um, I did listen to overlooked. <laughs> I listened to that episode. Overlooked. It was good. But um I ask, you know, and we're about the same age, so there's a lot of life to rummage through for this. But what is the one thing that you wish you had known earlier or that someone had told you sooner? Mm -hmm. God is good. He will work it together for good. Trust the process. Just like that. Yeah. Just like that. And it's that simple, isn't it? We try it's to overthink true. stuff. That true. Yeah. God is good. He will work it together for good. Trust the process. I want to thank you so much for coming to class for us today. Um, everybody, I will have all of... Uh, uh, Rhonda's connection uh, links and her uh, connect to her website, which you, where you can find all her books, but you can find them on Amazon or wherever you buy books as well. And her link to her podcast, I will have my links on there. I would love it. If you go over and download, rate, review, like, whatever you do, um, I would love the interaction. And I am just having a blast getting to do what I'm doing. And this has been fabulous, Rhonda. So thank you so much. And thank you for coming to class, everybody. Class dismissed.